Now a chess upset for the ages and a Paul Salmon. Whoa! Deep Blue Kasparov has resigned. Yesterday, in the sixth and final round of Man vs. Machine, the rematch, Machine didn't just beat Man, but trounced him, as IBM's Deep Blue computer beat I'm, world champion I'm Gary Kasparov. I'm ashamed by what I did at the end of this match, but so be it. Yesterday's loss in New York comes little more than a year after Kasparov beat Deep Blue in a six-game match in Philadelphia, three to one with two draws. In this year's rematch, Kasparov was even with the new, improved, super-duper supercomputer going into yesterday's contest. But the champ was clearly shaken. He does not look like a happy man. Gary Kasparov. By game two, which he should have played to a draw, but mistakenly resigned instead. By game five, a draw the computer forced, though Kasparov had the advantage and by the computer's seeming ability to play human-like strategies. After game five, to some, Kasparov sounded desperate. I'm not afraid to, to admit that I'm afraid. <laughs> and I'm not even afraid to say why I'm afraid. <laughs> because sometimes, you know, it, it definitely goes beyond any known chess program in the world. You know, it makes decisions that still cannot be made by any computer. And uh, facing such a challenge with no preparation, virtually no preparation before the match, I have to be extremely cautious. Sunday's showdown proved to be no contest. In fact, Kasparov made an early blunder that shocked experts. After just an hour of playing, instead of the usual four or so, Kasparov resigned the game and thus the match. At a post-game press conference, Kasparov sounded bitter and said another rematch would prove he could beat any machine. I think it's time for Deep Blue to start playing real chess. And I personally assure you, everybody here, that if Deep Blue will start playing competitive chess, I personally guarantee you, I'll turn it in pieces with no question. C.J. Tan, leader of the IBM team, savored the victory. It visibly shows the world that technology, what, can, what technology can do for man and how far we have been able to push technology. Kasparov says he wants a neutral party to sponsor a future contest. The Deep Blue team says it's considering his challenge. More now on this victory and to Margaret Warner. And now the smaller and larger meanings of this match. Frederick Friedel is Gary Kasparov's technical advisor and a computer chess expert. Daniel Dennett teaches philosophy at Tufts University. He wrote about computer intelligence in his book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea. And Hubert Dreyfus is a philosophy professor at the University of California at Berkeley. He's the author of the book, What Computers Still Can't Do. And welcome, gentlemen, to all of you. Uh, Frederick Friedel, why do you think Gary Kasparov lost this match? I think that he just didn't stand up to the pressure of the situation. The situation was very unusual for him. For 20 years, he's been playing chess against human beings in flesh and blood. Here, the opponent was completely invisible. It was backed up by a team of engineers and programmers. And every day, we heard of new grandmasters who had been on the team. So in some ways, he cracked in the end. Is that what he meant when he said, well, I'm a human being, and when I see something that's well beyond my understanding, I'm afraid? What he meant was that there were certain phases of the game which he just didn't understand. We had most of it analyzed quite well. Game one, game three, game four, but game two, he didn't understand, and it played very heavily on his mind, and I think game two uh, lost the match for him. And that's the one where a lot of experts said afterwards he missed a move that, in fact, he, so he cracked too soon. He missed a move well, that he could that, have made. That was an additional thing that right in the end he resigned because he assumed a computer that's playing so well would have calculated everything and the game, the game is lost. It looked very lost. And, and 200 people in the auditorium and 20 grandmasters noticed nothing. And then at 1 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the morning we discovered with a computer that it is a draw. He could have played on and drawn the, the game. Mm. Uh, Hubert Dreyfus, what do you think is the significance of this? There have been a lot of commentary about it. Newsweek magazine called it the brain's last stand. What do you see as the significance of this outcome? Well, I think, I think that's a lot of hype, that it's 
the brain's last stand. It's a significant achievement, all right, for the use of computers to rapidly calculate in a domain, and this is the important thing, completely separate from everyday human experience. It, it has no significance at all as far as the question, will computers become intelligent like us in the world that we're in? The reason the computer could win at chess, and everybody knew that eventually computers would win at chess, is because chess is a completely isolated domain. It doesn't connect up with the rest of human life. Therefore, like arithmetic, it's completely formalizable. And you could, in principle, exhaust all the possibilities. And in that case, a fast enough computer can run through enough of these calculable possibilities to see a winning strategy or to see a move toward a winning strategy. But the way our everyday life is that we don't have a formal world and we can't exhaust the possibilities and run through them. So what this shows is in a world in which calculation is possible, brute force, meaningless calculation, the computer will always beat people. But when in a world in which relevance and intelligence play a crucial role and meaning in concrete situations, the computer has always behaved miserably and there's no reason to think that that will change with this victory. Daniel Dennett, what do you see as the significance and, and respond if you would to Mr. Dreyfus's critique? Certainly. Um, it seems to me that right now is uh, time for the uh, skeptics to start moving the goalposts and I think Bert Dreyfus is doing just that. 150 years ago, Edgar Allan Poe was sure in his bones that no machine could ever play chess. And only 30 years ago, so was Hubert Dreyfus, and he said so in the earlier edition of his book. Um, then he's changed his mind, and as he says, it's, it's, it's really no surprise. People in the computer world have known for a couple of decades that this, this day was going to happen, and now it's happened. Uh, I think that the idea that Professor Dreyfus has that there's something special about the informal world is, is an interesting idea, but we'll just have to wait and see. The idea that there's something special about human intuition that is not capturable in a computer program is, is a sort of illusion, I think. Uh, when people talk about intuition, it's just because they don't know how something's done. If we didn't know how Deep Blue uh, did what it did, uh, we'd be very impressed with its intuitive powers. And we don't know how people live in the uh, informal world very well. And as we learn more about it, we'll probably be able to uh, uh, reproduce that in a computer as well. Uh, Mr. Dreyfus, do you think he's right that perhaps we don't still just don't completely understand what it is that humans do when they think, as, as we think I, of thinking? I think that we don't fully understand it in the sense that Dan Dennett and uh, people in the AI community mean by fully understand. By AI you mean artificial intelligence. Right. Yes. That is, we don't, we are not able to analyze it in terms of context-free features and rules for permuting these features. But I don't think that's just a limitation of our current knowledge. That's where I differ with Dan. There's something about the everyday world which is tied up with the kind of being we are. We've got bodies and we move around in this world and the way that world is organized is in terms of our implicit understanding of things like we move forward more easily than backward and we have to move toward a goal and we have to overcome obstacles. Those aren't facts that we understand. That We understand that just by the way we are, like we understand that insults make us angry. You can state those as facts, but I think there's a whole underlying domain of what we are as emotional embodied beings which you can't completely articulate as facts and which underlies our ability to make sense of facts and our ability to find any facts relevant at all. Can I say one word about this, this story? I never said that computers couldn't play chess. I've got a quote here. I said in 65, still no computer can play even amateur chess. That was a report on what was going on in mm -hmm. 1965. I've had to put up for 35 years with this story that I said computers could never play chess. In fact, I said from the beginning, it's a formal game, and of course computers could play, in principle could play, a uh, world champion chess. All right. Let me bring Mr. Friedel back in here. Mr. Friedel, did Gary Kasparov think the computer was thinking? Uh, not thinking, but that it was showing intelligent behavior. When Gary Kasparov plays against the computer, he has the feeling that it is forming plans, it 
uh, it understands strategy, it's trying to trick him, it's blocking his ideas, and then to tell him, you know, this has nothing to do with intelligence, it's just number crunching, seems very semantic to him. He says the performance is what counts. I see it behaves like something that's intelligent. If you put a, uh, if you put a curtain up, he plays the game, and then you open the curtain, and it's a human being, he says, ah, that was intelligent. And if it's a box, he says, no, that was just number crunching. It's the performance he, he's interested in. Daniel Dennett, I know you're not a chess expert, but I mean, do you feel that in this situation the computer was thinking in the way that, that Mr. Friedel said Gary Kasparov thought it was? I mean, that it was somehow independently making judgments? I'm probably using the wrong terminology yes, no, here. I think, but no, I think that's fine. I think that Kasparov has put his finger on it, too. It's the performance that counts. And Kasparov is not kidding himself when he sees, uh, when he confronts uh, Deep Blue and feels that Deep Blue is indeed parrying his threats and recognizing what they are and, and trying to trick him. This is entirely appropriate way to deal with that. Um, and if uh, pr Professor Dreyfus... Do you Dreyfus think it was capable of trying to trick Kasparov? Certainly. And Mr. Dreyfus? Your well, view on that? No, I think it was brute force, but the important thing is I'm willing to say, okay, it's the performance that counts, but it's the performance in a completely circumscribed formal domain where mere meaningless calculation can produce performance that looks full of trickery and intelligence and long-range strategy. There's no reason to think that any computer will ever produce that kind of performance in the everyday world. All right, let me get back. Daniel Dennett, uh, briefly in the time we have left, do you think, where do you think we are on the continuing, continuum of developing artificial intelligence? I mean, is Deep Blue at 10% of where computers can get, or 50%? Um, no, I don't think that's the right way to look at it. And in fact, um, Deep Blue and chess programming in general is a sort of offshoot to the most interesting work in artificial intelligence, and largely for the reasons that Bert Dreyfus says. I think the most interesting work is the work that, for instance, Rodney Brooks and his colleagues and I are doing at MIT with the humanoid robot COG. And as Dreyfus says, you've got to have a body. You've got to be embodied and live in a world uh, to develop real intelligence, and that's why COG does have a body. That's why COG is a robot. Now, if, if Bert will tell us what COG can never do and promise in advance that he won't move the goalposts and he won't say, well, this wasn't done in the right style, so it doesn't count. Right. If he'll just give us a few tasks that are now and forever beyond the capacity of COG, then, then we'll have a All new right. test. We have just a few seconds. Uh, Mr. Dreyfus, give us two tasks it'll never be capable of, okay. very if, quickly. Okay, if COG is programmed as a symbolic rule-using robot and not as a brain-imitating <laughs> robot, it won't be able to understand natural language. There's no reason why a computer that's simulating the way the neurons in the brain work won't be intelligent. I'm talking about how what's called symbolic manipulation won't be okay. intelligent. All right, thanks. We have to leave it there, but we'll return for further uh, discussion. Thanks.